Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Gabriella Golliger, National Chair of Canadian Friends of Peace Now. Our organization is the Canadian partner to Peace Now, Shalom Ashav, which is Israel's leading peace movement uh, and which promotes the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You can find out more about us on our website, peacenowcanada.org. <clears throat> we really hope you will consider supporting us with a donation, which you can do via our website. We rely entirely on donations from individuals like you. Uh, later on, we'll have time for audience questions. Please type your questions at any time using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please make your question as concise as you possibly can. Our webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our website. Now, this is a very anxious time for the Israeli people, the Jewish people, and for the Palestinian people. There's a deluge of information, but also misinformation out there. Our webinar today aims to help us gain some clarity. Our guest is Yossi Alfer, who is no stranger to uh, many of you, I'm sure. Yossi is an independent uh, Israeli security expert. He's a former senior official in the Mossad. He served as special advisor during the 2000 Camp David Accords. And he's the author of six books. He writes also, he writes a weekly column for Americans for Peace Now, which you can find on their website and which I really recommend. It's called Hard Questions, Tough Answers, and it's also always chock full of insight. There's a lot more I could say about our guest, uh, but we have a lot of ground to cover today uh, and we can only scratch the surface in this brief time. So I'd like to get, get to Yossi as quickly as possible. Uh, Yossi, thank you so much for being with us. My uh, pleasure. I'd like to start by giving us a bit of an introduction on where things stand with the current crisis. What is the status of the aerial and ground uh, war on Hamas? What's happening on the northern border? What is the mood of the country right now? Or start wherever you actually want to start. Okay, thank you very much, and hello, everybody. I see we've got a large crowd, so I'm going to keep my opening remarks uh, fairly short to uh, throw out a lot of topics that should hopefully encourage your, your questions and comments. Uh, this session is called Current Realities and Wider Implications, and I'm going to indeed divide my remarks between the current reality and some a, a kind of thumbnail sketch of, of wider implications as well. Uh, the current reality. As of a, a day and a half ago, the IDF is a, on the ground in the uh, northern Gaza Strip, in the northern part of the northern Gaza Strip, which is about all we know because a, a, the IDF is... is uh, is deliberately encouraging the fog of war. It doesn't want uh, a Yahya Sinwar, the uh, Gaza Hamas leader, to know what's going on, particularly since uh, it, the IDF has managed to silence uh, the entire uh, Gazan cyber sector, uh, black it out. Uh, so uh, uh, there's no information as to exactly where the IDF is and what they're doing. Um, this, this is not only in order to leave the uh, Hamas in the dark, but to leave Hezbollah and Iran in the dark, because there's a consistent fear from the from day one, from uh, from the seventh of October, that uh, uh, Hezbollah is waiting to join the fray. Uh, in a big way. So far, it's joined it in a very minor way, keeping uh, the IDF busy on the border, but not firing its, its huge rocket arsenal into Israel. And the idea is again here not to inspire it 
uh, to go any further than that. And so far, this has been quite successful. So the idea of offensive on the ground is slow. It's deliberate. The sense is we have plenty of time uh, as long as we show a concern for the humanitarian aspect uh, and uh, keep the US uh, in the picture uh, and keep in, in some way uh, our Arab neighbors in the picture because their tolerance of this offensive is also obviously extremely, uh, extremely important. Uh, what has emerged at the political leadership level in Israel uh, from the fiasco of, uh, of October 7th is a kind of troika of leaders, Prime Minister Netanyahu, Defense Minister Gallant, and uh, Benny Gantz, one of the leading opposition, one of the leaders of the opposition and a former IDF chief of staff, uh, they are the ones who last night, for example, appeared before the uh, Israeli public, incidentally, wearing uh, all wearing open collar black shirts, uh, style uh, um, Zelensky and Ukraine. In other words, we're, we're combat ready. We're ready to go. We've abandoned our business suits. Uh, we mean business. Uh, now, uh, a, this, that doesn't mean the Israeli public particularly buys this. Uh, there is a huge leadership crisis stemming from the perceived failure of the Netanyahu government to, uh, a, pre to prepare Israel for this war, to anticipate this war, to understand that its policies uh, are, uh, are sending, inadvertently sending signals to all of our Arab neighbors of Israeli weakness and of a, a, weak Israel, a weak Israeli deterrent profile. The writing was on the wall. The warnings were there. Uh, Netanyahu and his ministers, his many ministers, he's, he's, and his 64 member of Knesset coalition, and from a leadership standpoint, have not really recovered from this. And Netanyahu clearly has his mind on the commission of inquiry that will be appointed when this is all over. And uh, uh, therefore, while we have seen everybody involved, IDF, Shin Beit, uh, 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 even some ministers admit failure and take responsibility for what happened, Netanyahu consistently avoids doing this, sometimes in a in an almost comic way, uh, uh, because he doesn't want it on the record that he acknowledged responsibility because this will be thrown back at him uh, by a commission of inquiry. And his primary concern is to remain in office. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> a, let me go from here to the issue of wider implications. Uh, and they are many because this is not this conflict is not, obviously not confined just to Israel and the Gaza Strip. Uh, first of all, this the most central of the wider implications is the U.S. involvement. Uh, what has emerged in in recent weeks is uh, a a perception on the part of the United States that much as it would like to lower its profile in the Middle East, its strategic profile, and deal with the Far East, and deal with Ukraine, and deal with Russia and China, it can't. It's been dragged back in. Uh, it can't get out. It is reinforcing uh, <clears throat> American forces as far afield as, uh, as the Persian Gulf and, and in the Mediterranean as well. Uh, it is, in effect, uh, let it be known that if this conflict widens, uh, it, it will get involved. Uh, it will get involved with Iran and, and its uh, proxies, and particularly Hezbollah. And to that end, it has a major carrier group in the eastern Mediterranean. And we've seen a degree of uh, Israeli-American uh, military coordination without precedent to the extent of a 
of uh, special forces, uh, three-star general is sitting in the situation room with IDF planners and going over their plans for uh, uh, invading the Gaza Strip on the ground and uh, uh, giving us his ex the benefit of his experience in uh, taking back northern Iraq from uh, uh, from uh, ISIS uh, ten years ago. Uh, the second aspect of the US centrality of the U.S. is the recognition by Israel that we need the Americans. Uh, and this is not something Israel, is the Israeli security establishment readily admits. But from day one, uh, it was plain that we would need a, a, a emergency shipments of equipment, uh, of munitions, from the United States, particularly uh, the interceptor missiles of the Iron Dome system, which the U.S. Uh, also produces under license from Israel. Um, and there has been a, a, steady, a steady stream of American transport planes uh, bringing this equipment to Israel. So the whole, the, the keep in mind the centrality of the Israel-U.S. connection. Uh, <clears throat> another corollary of it, brought in by President Biden, who is, by the way, the darling of Israeli media and of the Israeli public since his visit here and his uh, embrace of us. Uh, uh, but a corollary is, uh, and this will interest this audience in particular, the return of the two-state solution, uh, which certainly has not been on the agenda of this Netanyahu government or any Israeli government for the past 15 years at least, since Ehud Olmer, it's more than 15 years. Uh, uh, the return of the two-state solution because Biden has put it on the agenda. And he has said quite openly, when this is over, we have to start talking about a two-state solution. Uh, this is also a, a corollary of the, uh, of the fact that Israel has now come fully uh, uh, confronting fully the fact that we don't have nor have ever had since Hamas took over the Gaza Strip in 2007, a strategy for Gaza. Uh, and this is now blown up in our face. Uh, and uh, it's clear that when this is over, the last thing we want to do is reoccupy Gaza, which is why there's a greater, seems to be a greater readiness in Israel, even Israel of center-right Israel, which is the dominant, uh, uh, which is the mainstream of Israeli politics today, uh, to contemplate somewhere beyond this war uh, a two-state solution. And, and so you see this interesting phenomenon of right-wing politicians anti-Palestinian, anti-two-state, all of a sudden, sudden saying, well, let's see, when this is over, we'll take the PLO, Palestinian Authority, that's in the West Bank and encourage them to set up shop uh, in the Gaza Strip as well, which is, of course, the, the, uh, the total opposite of everything Netanyahu has stood for in the last 15 years and which brought about this war. Uh, now, a, a, whether the U.S. has any real way to implement a two-state solution is another question, and I would submit that it's a bit early to get into the details of it because there are so many uh, variables in, in, in the overall picture of what's going on. Uh, it's not just Israel and the U.S., it's not just Hamas. It's the possibility of Hezbollah and Iran involvement. It's how the Egyptians feel about this. It's Jordan, which has a huge problem with its Palestinian population, which is uh, reputed to be more than 50% of the population and which is uh, uh, very uh, de demonstrating excitedly in favor of Hamas, as are a lot of Arabs throughout the Arab world. Uh, uh, and uh, 
right now what preoccupies the the US and Israel I would venture is the fear of escalation uh, uh, and uh, how, how do we how do you go about a, a satisfying Biden's a, agreement that we have to get rid of Hamas but at the same time satisfying Biden that we're not causing excessive civilian casualties, which is a huge problem in the highly overcrowded Gaza Strip. And this is what everybody is dealing with right now. Note that the Americans have said publicly, I don't know exactly which Americans, but that they are making contingency plans to evacuate as many as 600,000 Americans from Israel. Now, I never knew there were 600,000 Americans in Israel out of close to 10 million Israelis. Um, but they've said this publicly, and obviously this is looking at the possibility of a escalation involving a, a Hezbollah in southern Lebanon with its huge arsenal of long-range rockets and missiles that can hit virtually anywhere in Israel and can cause huge damage if indeed the uh, the Israeli ground offensive into the Gaza Strip prompts escalation by Hezbollah. Uh, what other can what other wider implications are worth keeping in mind? Uh, one that this is a confrontation by Israel and behind it the West, not only Biden, but the major European countries as well. Uh, and I assume Canada, although I, I haven't, we haven't had a visit from Mr. Trudeau, but I assume that Canada is in the picture as well. Uh, major confrontation with Arab and Iranian militant Islamism. Uh, and it could be, uh, it, it could get out of hand, uh, way out of hand, and this is why the whole conflict is is attracting so much attention. Uh, we are we began with a lot of international sympathy. We're losing it uh, as the uh, losses in the Gaza Strip now upwards of seven or eight thousand, according to Hamas. Uh, as the as the losses pile up, they will increase further, and we will lose more international sympathy. Something we're used to. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's, it pains us, given the justice of this, of, of uh, responding to Hamas's October 7th atrocity uh, by declaring war on it. Uh, finally, a word about the days ahead. Uh, I would define the Israeli uh, objectives for the days ahead as one a moving toward removing Hamas from power and defanging Hamas uh, to, in so doing, restore Israeli deterrence vis-a-vis -vis other Islamist neighbors who have designs on Israel like Hezbollah. We've got a potential additional Iranian-sponsored front and the, the Golan border with Syria as well. Uh, three, rescue the hostages. Uh, highly controversial issue. The army is taking pains to point out that the more successful its offensive, the easier it will be to negotiate a rescue of the hostages because Hamas will be weakened. Uh, the families of the hostages, some 200, over 230 and counting, uh, the families are frantic. They met with the prime minister yesterday uh, uh, and uh, poured out their concerns that the ground offensive will make it harder to make to, to rescue the hostages. Uh, and finally, down the line somewhere, or wait, one more one more important goal is the humanitarian goal to do all of this with causing as little harm as possible to Gaza and Gazans, which is a huge 
uh, a, a huge uh, challenge uh, for the IDF. And way down the line, beginning to think about uh, post Hamas, the future of the Gaza Strip. I think I'll stop here uh, and uh, turn the floor over to Gabriella. Okay, I see you. You've, you've certainly covered a lot of ground. And um, I just want to go back to the hostage issue, which is foremost on many people's minds. Um, you, you, you sort of talked about the two <laughs> opposing views. Do you have a view on this? Like, is the ground war, uh, are, are the families right that the ground war will make it harder? Uh, look, we'll never we'll never know. These are what ifs. Uh, these are hypotheticals. We have no basis for comparison with anything that has happened in the past. Uh, what is a, what is a increasingly apparent is this, though. Uh, there are more and more voices in Israel from a, a highly reputable people like former IDF chief of staff Shaul Mofaz uh, saying, look, Let's say to Hamas, we will empty our jail of all uh, terrorists, some 7,000 in number. We'll empty it in return for the hostages. You want a ceasefire for a couple of days to do this? Fine. What happens when, you, when this proposal is floated? And it, it has apparently been floated. Uh, first of all, Hamas says, uh, we'll give you all the hostages we have, but they don't hold all the hostages. Some of them are held by Islamic Jihad. Some of them are held by a, a, the rabble that saw that the fence was open on October 7th and poured into Southern Israel and, it, and grabbed hostages and took them to who knows where in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and Hamas doesn't even know how many hostages it has. It not, doesn't know where they all are. So uh, uh, this is problem number one. Problem number two is Hamas suddenly realizes, first of all, in my view, uh, a release, getting back its people from Israeli jails is the number one objective or was the number one objective of this entire Hamas attack. They wanted to take hostages to bargain for their prisoners. Don't forget Sinwar, who leads Hamas in Gaza, spent over 20 years in an Israeli jail. And he is honor bound to rescue his fellow terrorists in, in Israeli jails. So this is very high on the Hamas list. But all of a sudden, Hamas understands that Israel is not just into rescuing his hostages. Issue, issue, Israel is into destroying Hamas because it can't allow this to happen again. It can't send a signal to other Islamists that it's going to bow to their will and allow them to carry out atrocities like this and not destroy them. So all of a sudden, Sinwar understands he's not, if, if Israel succeeds, he's not, no, no, no one in Hamas is going to survive this war. So then he says to himself, well, I get back my 7,000 brothers from Israeli jails and the Israelis are going to kill or capture them all. What have I gained? Nothing. So he begins hedging his bets and, and we're at a stalemate. And this ground offensive began when the IDF concluded, not just the IDF, the whole security establishment conclude, concluded, concluded that there is no immediate chance for a prisoner exchange because of Hamas's position. And Hamas is going to have to be softened up uh, a, a, by militarily if it's going to agree to any to release any large number of hostages. And that's where we are right now. Uh, it, does this mean we'll get all the hostages back? Does it mean they'll all survive this war? Does it mean we know where they all are? Or even Hamas knows where they all are, being held underground, 70 meters underground in all kinds of caverns that they've hollowed out in the, in the sand? Uh, no, it, it's a horrible situation. Uh, but I, 
I, I believe the security establishment when it says hostage release, hostage rescue is the highest priority and it, it can't be facilitated unless we make some progress on the ground. Will it be facilitated when we make progress on the ground? I don't know. Will we physically free rescue hostages in who being held in Gaza? That's another possibility. And we may have intelligence on this that we're that we're acting on and planning on, and we just simply don't release that knowledge to to let Hamas know what we're doing. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh... Now, going back to the humanitarian issue, um, the dilemma of how do you conduct this war and minimize uh, uh, civilian casualties. And I, I wanted to just uh, um, talk about or, or quote a couple of questions we got in advance uh, from two sides of the issue here. Um, one is from Michael Korber, and he says he's interested in uh, knowing whether uh, Hamas is appropriating aid and fuel for themselves rather than providing it to the hospitals. So how much is Hamas responsible for the humanitarian issues? Uh, and and um, why? Ha and he's wondering why the Hamas uh, 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 numbers on civilians has gained so much more traction than the Israeli narrative about uh, about uh, Hamas's use of them as human shields. But before you answer that, we'll go to the other side of, you know, the someone I'm gonna from our board. By the and... time you get to the next question, Gabrielle, I'm going to forget where you started. Oh, okay, just, okay. So let just me just with deal with these. All right, these. all right. Hamas, yeah. look, Hamas are hard-bitten, cynical, brutal Islamists. If you want to know what their brutality is like, there are plenty of clips available of that they themselves took when they were butchering uh, Israelis on October 7th. Uh, and they, uh, it is well known that they appropriate fuel and anything else they need from hospitals, from any other humanitarian institution, from the UN from UNICEF or, 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 or other UN organizations on the ground uh, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, they have their headquarters under the Shifa hospital in the heart of the city of Gaza, underneath the hospital. The hospital is full of hundreds of patients and underneath is Hamas, which has been there for years. And Israel has now put this on the map because it's going to be looking for a way to deal with that underground headquarters without somehow without hurting the people in the hospital or removing them or, or whatever. Uh, but this is a huge dilemma. And this points to the dilemma of, of how to how to keep down law, uh, human losses in one of the most crowded places on earth, fighting a terrorist government, not organization, a terrorist government that uses its own people as human shields. It uses them as human shields. And so, yes, the losses will pile up. I, do, I frankly, with all due respect to every effort the IDF is gonna make, uh, a, 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 this is going to be awful. This will look awful, it will be awful. And this gets back to the third part of the question, which is, uh, Yes, we'll, we will be held to account for thousands of human lives among Gazan civilians that are unavoidable casualties of this war. And if we back off and say, no, 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 humanitarian considerations come first, we can't do this, then Hamas survives. And, and if Hamas survives, militant, Islamism, the militant Islamist challenge to Israel's very existence gets a huge boost. And next will come Hezbollah, and next will come other Iranian uh, 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 proxies uh, uh, on Syrian soil, or even in Yemen, where the Houthis have already been firing missiles at us. 
Uh, so uh, it, it, this is uh, this is ugly. This is ugly. It will get uglier. Uh, but what Hamas did on October 7th convinced us that we have no alternative. And I really think we have no alternative. We won't be very popular when this is over. Okay. So so just another question from another, you know, advanced question from uh, on the subject is, uh, would it not cost, it's about getting humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. Would it not, uh, couldn't, Israel provide food, shelter, and medicine to Gazans in the south or in encampments within Israel proper. I don't know how that would be uh, for children, women, the elderly, and disabled. So could could Israel win some, uh, I guess, propaganda points? And and um, and and is Israel letting some humanitarian aid in? I, I it read. is. It is indeed. And today, Israel announced it's going to open another water pipe into southern the southern Gaza Strip uh, for the Gazans there. Uh, look, this when this began, the Israeli military leadership declared a siege on the Gaza Strip. Nothing goes in. No fuel, no water, no food. Only what they have indigenously and what they grow indigenously. This was a reaction to the atrocity of October 7th, an irrational reaction. And to the fact that a, a, the strategic, the grand strategic error that uh, allowed us to be surprised by the Hamas attack was for 15 years under Netanyahu and under Naftali Bennett, in the brief period of time he was prime minister, uh, a, a, what they called, what the Israeli right wing called economic peace. What is economic peace? If your enemy have full stomachs, they won't want to make war on you. This was the approach to the Gaza Strip. So 20,000 Gazans could come to work in Israel and spy on the kibbutzim where they worked and, and get the lay of the land there. Uh, and uh, a, a Qatar, a major sponsor of the Muslim Brotherhood, of which Hamas is the Palestinian manifestation, could be allowed to bring in tens of millions of dollars every month to keep Hamas afloat. And we, we, all, we, we approved of all this because economic peace. The Gazans will be, will be quiescent. They won't want to challenge us. And if for right-wing governance who have no interest in talking to the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank about a two-state solution. This is ideal. They have an alternative of Hamas in Gaza. Hamas doesn't want to talk to us. Hamas doesn't believe in a two-state solution. Much easier to cultivate Hamas than to talk to the PLO, Palestinian Authority. This is how we got where we got. And this is why the gut reaction uh, uh, on October 7th including among people who realized their own mistake in having been led astray by this economic peace idea, was, okay, we cut everything off. Qataris can't bring money, Gazans can't work in Israel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this was a mistake uh, because you're, you're punishing the ordinary Gazans, 2.2 2 million of them, uh, for your own mistake vis-a-vis -vis Hamas for, for the last 15 years. And Biden set us straight on this, and we have allowed in humanitarian aid since then, and we've, uh, we've agreed to eat, that Egypt open up the Rafah crossing to let the humanitarian aid in, in from Egypt. And so this, is, this picture has changed, and it's my understanding that more aid is coming in uh, a, a, from Israel directly, from Egypt, uh, although Egypt has to agree to open its border with the Gaza Strip, and this is a, a, a factor that Israel has no direct control over. Okay, I'm just going to ask you one more for me, and then we'll get to a pile of audience questions. And I just want to um, apologize to some of my board members who who give who fed me other questions, but I I I, I want to uh, 
allow our broad audience to answer uh, to ask have a chance to ask you questions so so just quickly can you comment on what's going on on the west bank because that's uh part of the picture well what's going on today on the west bank mm -hmm. is or let's say since this war began and israel's focus pa palestinian lens was focused on gaza not on the west bank is two two entirely uh, uh, anticipated or expected phenomena on the one hand the right-wing messianists who are so well represented in netanyahu's government the Mo smotrich ben gvir etc uh this the the hill youth in the in the so-called illegal settlements which have been proliferating for the past year uh so decided they had the opportunity when nobody's paying any attention to the West Bank to grab some more land and to harass some more Palestinians and even to kill some Palestinians. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the other, uh, a, a, the Palestinian population of the West Bank uh, have a close affinity with the Palestinian population of the Gaza Strip. And uh, they are demonstrating in support of them, the West Bank and, and, and East Jerusalem. Uh, if you take these two, two developments together, the IDF in the West Bank has its hands full. Uh, and uh, this means we, we've had, I believe, upwards of 90 Palestinians killed in the West Bank in the course of the past three and a half weeks. Uh, from from all of this, and at the same time, you can say the West Bank is not in. There's no new intifada there. There's no open revolt there. Uh, a, the IDF is succeeding in channeling the protests there, uh, with the goal of avoiding yet another front on the West Bank. I've already talked about the Gaza front, the Lebanon front, the. Uh, Syria front, uh, there's also the danger of a, of a West Bank front. Uh, uh, there are plenty of Hamas uh, adherents in the West Bank. One of Hamas's goals in starting this war was to make, a, which it calls the Al-Aqsa flood, uh, was to make a statement uh, of a Hamas leadership of the entire Palestinian movement, uh, and particularly Hamas as a candidate to take over the West Bank, uh, either uh, before Abu Mazen departs the scene or after he parts, departs the scene, either one of which is presumably not too far away. So this is another important aspect of Hamas's war goals. And therefore, it's very important for Israel to try to, uh, and for Jordan to the east of the West Bank, to try to subdue any serious unrest there. Thank you. Um, I've got a uh, question from, okay, Dr. Alexander uh, Lohengarov. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. And it, there's three questions, but I'll, I'll just uh, ask one of them. Um, what's your opinion on equating Hamas with ISIS and Al-Qaeda? Uh, Let's expand the question and, and uh, equating it with the Nazis. Uh, it, we've heard all of this. Uh, there's a lot of bombast in Israel in dealing with Hamas. Uh, the e e equation with ISIS is stemmed from the fact that at least one of the Hamas terrorists uh, who were killed in the, uh, in the October 7th attack had with him some sort of documentation trying to link Hamas to ISIS. Now, the Hamas-ISIS link makes sense in the sense that these are both militant Islamist, Sunni Islamist movements with fairly similar goals or not. No, I would stop there. I mean, Hamas's goals, goals to the best of my knowledge, have always been restricted to Israel-Palestine, whereas ISIS considers itself a global movement. Um, and uh, uh, a, that's number one. The, the, the a 
comparison to the Nazis. Look, a lot of people got let their emotions get out of hand and made all kinds of comparisons, um, which I think are just basically not necessary. Um, you can't take the events of one day, October 7th, and decide that this turns Hamas into Nazis. They're bad enough without, without turning them into Nazis. Uh, the, the bestiality, the, the, the cruelty that they exhibited, uh, I don't. I, I I just have a hard time with this, uh, with with these with these comparisons. I just don't think they're necessary. But I, I, I do understand why people make them, uh, in in the hope of persuading the world that what we're up against is not just a local enemy, but some sort of globalized enemy. Whether it's Nazis or ISIS, or uh, Al-Qaeda, uh, in order to get the, uh, ad the sympathy and adherence and support of larger portions of the world. Uh, I, in the long run, I don't think this works either, uh, because I think ultimately the world uh, is looking at the, uh, at the clips that come out of the Gaza Strip uh, the human suffering, the destruction, the losses, uh, and uh, and uh, it, it's hard to keep their attention on the atrocities of October seventh and on the idea, the ugly Islamist ideology, uh, anti-Semitic ideology of Hamas, when what they're looking at are these ugly clips, and that's why you have demonstrations at you know universities in the West, uh, uh, all of a sudden Hamas are progressives, they're Democrats, uh, rather incredible stuff being thrown around on campuses, especially. Um, and this is a huge challenge for Israel. And bear in mind, it's a challenge for a, for a dysfunctional Israeli government. This government, since its founding almost a year ago, has been dysfunctional. It, it, in order to put together a coalition of 64 uh, members of Knesset, Netanyahu brought in, uh, in incapable, inept people from uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox movements, from uh, Messianist, right-wing, Kahanist movements, uh, and uh, promoted Likudniks who, who, uh, who had no business being elected to the Knesset, and these are the people running the government. And one of the phenomena, one of the fascinating phenomena of the past three weeks has been that since the government is not properly functioning, uh, volunteer citizens have taken over, providing essential services. And these volunteer citizens are the same people who were opposing Netanyahu's judicial reform up until three and a half weeks ago. Uh, and that's the reality in Israel. But this also means that our Hasbara, our public diplomacy, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a, a, the su a supporters of the of these Islamist movements or the haters of Israel or the anti-Semites or whatever, who are gathering steam and being nurtured by the losses in the Gaza Strip, uh, their contentions are going unanswered by a defunct public diplomacy bureaucracy. Thank you. Um, I'll go to a question by David Brooks, and this is you know, going something quite different. He's asking about the, the proposal that Naftali Bennett made, uh, and it was published in the New York Times. Now, there's a lot of elements to that, but I think the, the main one was rather than doing a comprehensive ground war, to sort of try to cut off the north and uh, create an enclave in which the uh, Hamas basically starve in their tunnels uh, is I don't know if you're familiar if you if you read what he he wrote and do you think it's he's got a good idea? Look, we're flooded by public proposals from all kinds of directions and people. Uh, first of all. Uh, 
for all we know, this is exactly what the IDF is doing right now. But it is concealing its movements and its strategy uh, in order to keep the enemy off guard. So uh, let, let's begin with the fact that the IDF uh, uh, has tried to div divide the Gaza Strip in two by uh, telling residents of the northern part to go to the southern part, south of the Gaza River, uh, uh, which corresponds more or less with what Bennett is, is proposing. Um, secondly, there's a sense that the IDF understands this is going to be a slow operation requiring a lot of patience, among other, th other things, in order to avoid losses and keeping in mind the humanitarian aspect and assuming that we will be able to maintain this momentum and maintain support from the West over weeks and possibly months. So uh, what Bennett was proposing uh uh, well, finally, a, a one answer to Bennett is that Hamas has presumably stored months' worth of food and fuel in its tunnels. In other words, they could conceivably hold out for months, with or without hostages, uh, and try to wait us out. Um, all this is totally speculative, and... Uh, we don't know what the IDF operational plan is, nor should we know, nor should Hamas know, and we're just going to have to wait and see. Okay. Uh, a question that goes back to the humanitarian issue, and that is uh, as somewhat challenging uh, what you, some of what you said, in other words, is, um, is Israel really <clears throat> focusing so much on the humanitarian issue? It, it, having only let in a few trucks in a f in three weeks and no fuel and bombs that have fallen in the south and i think that's one of the uh, you know how come they're still bombing in the south if that's supposed to be a safe place for for the uh yeah they're still bombing in the south because hamas is also in the south and there are strategic targets there uh, with regard to fuel, the assumption is any fuel allowed into the Gaza Strip will be expropriated by Hamas and simply allow it to prolong the war. Uh, that's the operative assumption. So food and water are being allowed in. Um, a fuel, to the best of my knowledge, not. How the hospitals were survived under these conditions, I don't know. Uh, and as I said, this is ugly and it's going to be ugly and get ugly. And that's the only way to defeat Hamas and the only way to restore Israeli deterrence, which is absolutely vital if we're going to survive against Iran and all its Islamist friends. Okay. Uh, a question from Sean Goldman. This sort of goes in takes us to the past a little bit. How do you explain the six hour long delay in response by the IDF on the day of the attacks? This was a dramatic operational failure on the part of the IDF. Dramatic operational failure from the chief of staff on down. Uh, there were so many mistakes made uh, due to complacency, due to the assumption that Gaza is not going to attack us, that Hamas is not going to attack us. It's not going to attack us because they have full stomachs. It's not going to attack us because the only, if we're going to encounter a, a an attack, it will be on several Islamist fronts at once. In other words, Hamas and Gaza and Hezbollah uh, and various Isla uh, Iranian, Iranian uh, uh, Shiite militias on the Lebanese and, and Syrian fronts. And when there were no indications of military activity on the northern fronts, the assumption was this couldn't happen in the south. Then there was over-reliance on the fence as, a, as a, uh, an engineering marvel that would keep our enemies out. Uh, and and uh, this government, with its emphasis on settlement in the West Bank, had transferred military units from the Gaza periphery, units protecting this 
kibbutzim around the Gaza periphery had been transferred to the West Bank to protect the, the new settlers. And weaponry had been taken from the kibbutzniks uh, and transferred to the West Bank. So in this atmosphere, the IDF was totally unprepared. Now, chief of staff has taken taken the blame. He's taken responsibilities. I have no doubt that when this is over, he will resign. I have no doubt that the chief of the Southern Command will resign. Head of intelligence, uh, head of the Shin Beit, which was responsible for intelligence in Gaza. We'll see a lot of resignations. We'll see an investigation. We'll understand better uh, the nature of those six hours. Uh, but that six hour delay, it was, it, it, still keeps a lot of Israelis from sleeping. Thank you. Um, Harvey Goldberg asks, is it true that many of the Arab leaders want Hamas eliminated but can't say it publicly? I would say that's true. I would say that's true of, of non-Islamist Arab leaders. Uh, and, and that means uh, not necessarily the leaders of Qatar, for example, who are heavy supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood and of, of Islamism, uh, but the Egyptians, the Jordanians, absolutely. Uh, even Assad in Syria, who just fought a 10 year civil war against Islamists, uh, would agree to that proposition that he'd like to get, get rid of Hamas, but you won't hear any one of them saying that, I agree to that too. And this is the reality in the Middle East. And it's because the Arab, Arab leaders may understand the dangers posed by Hamas, but the Arab street, meaning public opinion, is much more supportive of Hamas. And when they see Hamas slaughtering Israelis and temporarily occupying, even for half a day, Israeli territory, they're out on the street celebrating. That's, that's who our neighbors are. What about Turkey? What about? Turkey. Turkey. Erdogan. Look, Erdogan's uh, uh, ruling party, the AKP, is an Islamist party uh, with an affinity for the Muslim Brotherhood. It's not Muslim Brotherhood, but it has an affinity for the Muslim Brotherhood. It has given shelter to Muslim brothers who fled Egypt when Sisi took over in 2013 and kicked out the uh, Muslim Brotherhood government, which ruled Egypt for a year after the revolution there. It has given them shelter. And uh, 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 and uh, Erdogan seems to waver back and forth between uh, certain strategic needs he has vis-a-vis -vis Israel and his support for militant Islam. Uh, and what you just saw now is he's, he's basically saying, uh, you know, I was going to visit Israel. I'm canceling my visit. He had been hoping to uh, sign some sort of contract to lay a pipeline to get Israeli natural gas. We have natural gas in the uh, a seabed of the Mediterranean off our Mediterranean coast. Uh, uh, Turkey is a natural um, junction of uh, pipelines linking gas pipelines, linking Europe, uh, Asia, uh, Europe and Asia, uh, Europe or Europe and the Middle East. Uh, and uh, he, uh, Turkey has all the infrastructure it needs. He was planning to try to buy uh, a Israeli natural gas. And for that, he needed to be nice to us and needed to be friendly. Well, he's just, he's just thrown all of that out. Uh, I dare say, I don't think many Israelis uh, really believed we could do a deal with Erdogan precisely because he's so volatile and so readily changes his mind in accordance with these sorts of developments uh, uh, between Israel and uh, and the Arab countries. And in that sense, he's acted according to uh, uh, what could be expected of him. Thank you. But um, uh, mind you, when this is over, Turkey will still be a favorite vacation place for a lot of Israelis. That's also the Middle East. Okay. 
uh, here's a question uh, from some anonymous question, um, and it looks towards you know when this is over. And is it realistic to think that Israel's military response will leave any room for peace negotiations, given the loss of life in Gaza? Is Israel not laying the foundation for a new generation of traumatized militants? You know. It's a good question. Uh, I don't know how realistic it is. Uh, and here, I, I refer you back to Biden, who tries to cover all the bases. Get rid of Hamas, but don't occupy the Gaza Strip. And be humanitarian and don't kill too many Palestinians. And then get back to the two-state solution. Well, how do you do all this? How do you get rid of Hamas and, uh, and uh, limit... Palestinian losses in the Gaza Strip and set the stage for a renewed two-state process with angry Palestinians, both in Gaza and in the West Bank. Uh, I don't know. There are some naive Israelis who actually think, and not only Israelis, who actually think when this is over, the uh, a PLO, Palestinian Authority, based in Ramallah in the West Bank, will agree to return to ruling the Gaza Strip, which they ruled before 2007, uh, uh, on uh, backed up by Israeli bayonets, something which I don't think any self-respecting Palestinian would ever agree to. Uh, so how this all is going to work, I don't know, but I nevertheless think it's imp think thought it's important to point out that one unexpected byproduct of this whole drama of the past uh, three and a half weeks has been to put the two-state solution back on the regional agenda and on the international agenda, however problematic and unrealistic some of the mechanics and circumstances may be. And but one other point, we don't know how this is going to end, how this war is going to end. It's just, it's just getting started. It's going to go on for weeks and probably months. We don't know how it's going to end. We don't know how the region is going to behave. We don't know how the great powers are going to behave. So it, 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 my, my inclination is to say, you know, it's all well and good to talk about uh, renewing a two-state solution peace process once uh, Hamas has been removed. Uh, from power and and and, and uh, there are more peace-minded people in the Gaza Strip, uh, but uh, it, it's presumptuous also to begin the planning now, which I think the United States is doing. I think it's presumptuous to begin the planning when when the, when we we're just at the beginning of this war. We don't know what the months ahead hold for us, uh, uh, and we don't know what the situation will look like. Um, so I think it's a bit over idealistic to even talk about this now, although I fully understand the inclination to do that. No, nope. I would like more than anybody else to see a renewed two state process come out of this war. Just sort of on that subject, is it still important to at least hold out the vision that this is the only solution? It, I, first of all, I, I don't know if it's the only solution, but it, it's certainly uh, a better solution than anything else anybody has in mind. Uh, and uh, it, it is important to hold it out. And it is important basically to say, look, Hamas stirred the pot. Uh, Hamas a, a, a signed its death warrant. If Hamas is eliminated, at least as a power factor, then you have a new Israeli-Palestinian balance. And lots of ideas can come onto the agenda. First and foremost, the two-state solution, even though it may be premature, don't forget that the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank is totally dysfunctional. Abu Mazen at age 87, I think, or eight, is barely functioning. Uh, Hamas is a power factor there. Uh, uh, the settlers are a major power factor there. Uh, Israeli politics 
at least up until this war, has been increasingly right-wing religious messianic bent on, on holding on to the land of the West Bank. Uh, you've got all these factors at work. We're stirring the pot. Uh, a lot will depend on what happens in Palestinian politics, i.e. the future of Abu Mazen and who replaces him, and in Israeli politics. Uh, a, does Netany do Netanyahu and his followers pay a, pay a price for the folly that brought about this war? Uh, do Israelis understand it? Will, will Israelis get rid of him? Will Israelis install a government more a, a open to discussing a two-state solution and to reigning in the settlers? Uh, these are all open questions, impossible to answer today. You can only say, Yes, the situation gives you room for hope that you didn't have before. I mean, certainly before this war, I confidently predicted we're going to see more right-wing religious messianic a, a political influence and rule in Israel, leading us down a slippery slope toward a disaster. Uh, could this war cause people to, th to think again? Well, maybe, maybe. It's, 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 it, if, it, if that happens, it would be very sad we paid such a huge price for it, but at least it could put us back in the right direction. Okay. Uh, you'll see, before we started, uh, you had said you're willing to go for an extra 15 minutes. Do you still feel that way? Absolutely, okay. yeah, okay. no problem. Because we still have a, a large audience and lots of questions. Um, going again backwards into a, the another area that we you had touched on uh, about the humanitarian issue, um, we had a question whether Israel is still is abiding by international law. On uh, you know, can you answer that question? Look, I, I'm not an I'm not an expert on international law. I don't pretend to be. Um, I read and listen to what the international legal experts say, and I take note that they don't agree about a lot of things. Uh, certainly, uh, the Israeli, first of all, Israeli experts on international law and military law have been arguing since 2005 that we no longer occupy the Gaza Strip. When we withdrew, withdrew the settlers from the Gaza Strip, and left open the Gaza Strip's a link to Egypt, that is to the Arab world, uh, we cease to be occupiers. Now, there's a large body of international jurisprudence who, who don't agree, who argue we still occupy the Gaza Strip. In other words, in their view, this Hamas attack is a, a, a revolt by subjects of Israeli military rule against Israel. Whereas in the view of most Israeli experts, this is an attack on Israel by a neighboring semi-state. And, and Hamas Islamist state. Uh, so a lot begins with there because uh, a, when you're judging what happens in the war, the question is, is this a war between an occupying power and local rebels? or it is a war between two, basically two neighboring political entities. Uh, so, you, you, which I happen to believe, but I, I'm not an expert on this. This is just my, my the way I see the situation. Uh, now, Israeli military units, all of them, have a, embedded in them legal experts on military law, on humanitarian law, every, every operational directive is looked at by these lawyers, these military lawyers, uh, just to make sure it will, it will comply with international law. This is what, by the way, this is what the, a, a popular opposition to Netanyahu's judicial reform was all about. Why did the military lead the opposition? Why did the pilots refuse to show up 
the reserve pilots refused for a while to show up for training because they were saying, we can't go into combat if you, Netanyahu, are going to dismantle the, our High Court of Justice, which is universally recognized by the all the, in, the legal international legal institutions in The Hague and elsewhere uh, as, as a, a reliable authority on Israeli compliance with international law. Uh, this is what was behind the biggest aspect of the opposition to Netanyahu's policies, these same policies which sent Hamas the message that Israel is weak and has lowered it, its, its deterrent. Uh, needless to say, the pilots showed up and started, the reserve pilots showed up and started flying the minute this war began. Uh, but uh, the, the, how you weigh collateral damage, which under international law and under various aspects of international law, you're allowed to cause in attacking an enemy target. How you weigh the collateral damage is a, a, an issue of huge controversy in international law. I can only say that uh, Israel has been challenged uh, uh, in The Hague repeatedly by the Palestinians, by pro-Palestinian uh, actors uh, uh, who accuse it of, uh, in previous rounds of fighting with Hamas in Gaza, accuse it of, of violating international law and has not been uh, uh, brought to account by these international courts at all. They have accepted the Israeli reasoning. They've accepted the Israeli reasoning because they respect the Israeli legal, international legal establishment. And I would suggest that that's going to be the case this time as well, which is not to say there are not going to be huge losses, but Hamas is using its civilian population as human shields, which they are not allowed to do under international law. And they're never held, held to account by international law because they're not a sovereign state. Okay. <clears throat> A lot of more questions. I'm just going to get. A, we only have time for a couple here, um, and uh, some of them are rather go over ground you've already uh, uh, touched on. Well, let's I'm let's break new grounds. Yeah. Okay. So one is uh, from John Snipper. If if Netanyahu won't go when this is over, do you see the IDF in, intervening in a in a, in a putsch? <laughs> so. If Netanyahu doesn't resign, will the will the IDF uh, uh, stage a coup? <laughs> is basically the question. In the questioner's dreams, no. The answer is no. Uh, uh, the I, the Israeli security establishment has never challenged uh, a, Israel's civil a, a governmental setup. Uh, and uh, throughout the very tumultuous events of the past year, uh, when, again, there was strong sentiment in the IDF against Netanyahu's judicial reforms uh, because of the difficulty of fighting a war if he carries out those reforms, uh, nowhere was there ever talk of any kind of sedition or, or revolt against uh, the, the elected civil elected government uh, Israeli democracy held fast, and it will continue to hold fast. Netanyahu was elected in democratic elections, uh, and he represents a majority of the Knesset, and everybody understands that. Uh, you want to get you want to you want to get rid of him? Persuade five out of sixty-four members of Knesset and his coalition to say enough. Enough, we're, we're leaving the coalition. We're gonna vote no confidence in him. Thus far, despite the scandal of the events of the last three and a half months, not a single one of those 64 members of Knesset has uh, in any way indicated they're going to back out and, and uh, uh, out of the coalition and vote against Netanyahu. That says something for the low level of uh, uh, Israeli politics, 
and Israeli politicians on both sides, I have to say. Um, but it, uh, it, it does not invite any sort of intervention by any, anyone in the security community. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to just, uh, we'll have time for one more question, but before we do that, I, I just want to throw in another quick reminder to our audience that um, I invite you to support Canadian Friends of Peace now uh, with a donation by going to our website. Uh, www.peacenowcanada.org and we rely entirely on individual uh, donations. So um, I'm going to give the last word or question to Awad Lubani and I think it's, you have touched on this, but still, it's it's still, he puts it in a different way. When will Israeli, the is when would the Israelis understand that uh, Hamas is a religious ideology and thus cannot be eliminated and that the only solution to make Hamas irrelevant is by using the Rabin strategy in dealing with Arafat and you might have to clarify that and uh, Netanyahu and the ultra-religious right is the other side of ex uh, extremism that will destabilize the Middle East so the question is it really uh can you eliminate uh, this religious ideology that is Hamas? You can't. I don't. I don't think you can or want to eliminate Islamist ideology. Islam, Islamist ideology. Uh, a, you. We have a right to protect ourselves when militant Islam wants to murder us all. When militant Islam says the Jews started World Wars One and Two, that's in the Hamas Constitution, and they have to be eliminated. Uh, when militant Islam invades Israel and butchers Isra 1,400 Israeli civilians and takes nine-month-old babies and 85-year-old uh, grandmothers into captivity, uh, this is bestiality. Uh, I, I think a self-respecting Muslim and I know some self-respecting Muslims, has to condemn this, simply has to condemn this. And uh, a, and I'm very disappointed with that more Muslims don't condemn this. But a, a, this is, I mean, this is not Islam any more than a, a, the Messiah, Ben Gvir and Smotrich's Messianic settlers trying to take over the Temple Mount and kick the Palestinians out of the West Bank represent Judaism. These are aberrations and they have to be dealt with. And in the case of Islam, of Hamas, they physically, brutally attacked and murdered us. And the, I, I happen to agree that for our own survival and because it, they're not the only ones, Hezbollah would not behave any differently with Israeli civilians. And some of the other uh, uh, Iran-sponsored uh, proxies also. And, and we have to send, we don't have to fight them all, but we have to uh, fight and beat Hamas to send a message of deterrence that this we will not allow this to happen again. Okay. So I am going to wrap things up, uh, Yossi. And uh, first of all, thank you very much happy very, to do this um, at this very fraught and difficult time uh giving us so much of your expertise it's a really it's a privilege to to listen to you to hear your uh so from the hear what you have to say from the wealth of your experience um i'd like to, to rem uh, thank our audience for for participating uh, i'm sorry we didn't get to all, to all the questions we're a lot of them um, hopefully we'll have you back. Uh, this is, unfortunately, this, you're, you're suggesting this will take a long time. So, uh, we may meet again. We may meet again. Uh, uh just a quick reminder to the, or, or note to our audience. We have another webinar next week, next Sunday on a, the peace camp perspective on the current crisis with, uh, Jonathan Mizrahi from the uh, Settlement Watch program. 
So stay tuned for details for that. Uh, Yossi, thank you again. Uh, I wish you safety for you and your family and better days for all Israel and for the Palestinians too. Uh, thank you all and uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you, Gabriella. I'm happy to have been able to do this. Good night. Bye.